France, 1941. German pilots prepare for yet another bombing raid. Their target? Plymouth, England. The hoe on the Plymouth coastline. It's hard to believe that not too long ago, just over there, a 420 foot long pier used to jut out into the sea. It's just yet another feature of this city, completely erased by history. Looking around, it's difficult to comprehend just how much of Plymouth was destroyed. But with nearly 4,000 homes demolished and another 18,000 severely damaged, Plymouth became one of the worst attack cities in the country. But why Plymouth? At the outbreak of the war, Plymouth was seen as something of a haven. Out of range of the German Luftwaffe, people were evacuated here in their hundreds, and it was quickly becoming a boom town. Then, France fell. Using the French airfields, Hitler could now extend his reach to the whole of England. Plymouth, along with other ports and industrial towns, quickly became a prime target. By February 1941, bombing efforts were concentrated almost entirely on seaports in support of the Battle of the Atlantic. Plymouth bore the brunt of these attacks, being one of the two most important Royal Navy bases in the United Kingdom. There were 59 separate raids, with a total of 1,172 people killed and another 3,000 injured. Practically every civil building was destroyed, along with 40 churches and 20 schools. At one point, the population fell from 228,000 to just 127,000. Over two nights of bombing alone, 336 were killed and buried in mass graves at Efford Cemetery, each simple wooden coffin draped with a Union flag. The Plymouth Fire Brigade found itself completely unable to cope with the devastation and called in help from other brigades as far away as Birmingham. Yet these brigades found their own equipment incompatible with that used in the city, and so could only helplessly watch the fires as they eventually burned themselves out. As French writer André Sauvignon, who was in the city at the time, put it, one has the almost physical impression that a city is slipping away from under one's very feet. But still, life went on, in testament to the resilience of the British people. In 1941, city restaurants recorded record sales of 65,000 meals. With the dance halls destroyed, people instead took to dancing on the hoe, often as many as 6,000 at a time. And the vitally important jobs in the city's naval dockyard were still being filled. As Churchill said on his May 1941 visit to the city, your homes are down, but your hearts are high. But what was it actually like to experience the Blitz firsthand? Brian Cumming is the county chairman of the Royal British Legion. He was just seven when war broke out. I think the first we really heard about it was when father came in and said he was going to dig up the, the lawn at the back of the house and, and put a, a, a tin hut in it, uh, which he called an Anderson. And of course, at seven years old, and my, daughter, my sister was five, we didn't even know what a bomb was. So that was our first, my first recollection of uh, what was happening. It was something different that was happening out of the norm. Well, the, the first time that we came into contact with the bomb was when an incendiary dropped through uh, the roof. Uh, it went through the ceiling onto my sister's bed. It then bounced off the bed out into the hall 
um, on the top landing that was, and uh, lodged against um, a wardrobe that was there, and then burnt its way through and dropped down into the living room. Um, I think my mother coped with it very well. Um, she um, spent most of her time obviously looking after us and um, seeing us backwards and forwards at school. And the, the rest of the time, I think she was um, not coerced, but invited into rolling bandages which was um, one of the things that the ladies did to, to help towards the, uh, the war effort. Um, but as far as the children, we as children were concerned, I, I think initially we, we just thought it was a big game. Finally, after a sustained bombardment against the British Isles, Hitler's invasion of the USSR required all the resources Nazi Germany could muster, including air power. And so, with the Luftwaffe relocated to the Eastern Front, the Blitz in Plymouth officially ended. Seven nights of concentrated bombing had left the centre of the city in ruins. The priority for Plymouth now was no longer simply to survive, it was to recover and rebuild. The task of redesigning Plymouth from the ground up fell to city engineer James Patton Watson and Sir Patrick Abercrombie. Their Plan for Plymouth was published in October 1943 and work commenced in 1947. The basic plan centred around building a 1,000 yard long road linking the Hoe and the railway station, with roads turning off at right angles. This was to be known as Amada Way, although it originally had the much more appropriate title of Phoenix Way. This bench commemorates one of the worst tragedies of the Blitz when, during the April raids, a bomb shelter suffered a direct hit with a loss of at least 72 lives. A new, more fitting memorial is due to be unveiled in April of this year as a reminder of the horrors the people of Plymouth had to endure. And endure they did. One of the greatest examples of this spirit occurred when, expressing the attitude of an entire city and its populace, an unknown woman visited the gutted St Andrew's Church and left a sign above his entrance. It read simply, Resurgent, meaning, I shall rise again. We'll meet again, don't know where, don't know when, but I know we'll meet again some sunny day. Smiling through just like you.